Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now you will hear Pastor Rich preach the topical Mother's Day sermon titled, A Special Mother, from Matthew 1 verses 18 through 25 and John 19 verses 17 through 27. We pray that God would use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now to Pastor Rich. Well, good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day. All right, so I want to start by telling you a story about four pastors. Four pastors got together and they were discussing what their favorite translation of the Bible is. So many people ask, I use New King James because that's what they used in Bible college. It kind of stuck. It isn't like that's the best end all be all. It's just what's stuck. So these four pastors get together and one guy says, you know, I like the King James version the best because it's very poetic in its language. The second pastor says, well, I like the New American Standard because it is the closest word by word within the Greek translation. The third pastor says, well, I got to tell you, I like the New Living Translation because it's so easy to understand. The fourth pastor was silent for a minute and then he thought about it and he said, well, my favorite translation is the one my mom had. And the other three went, your mom made a Bible translation? My mother lived out the Bible every single day of her life, and it was the best translation of the Bible I had ever seen. You, you see, this pastor was fortunate enough to have a godly parent that lived out the scripture in front of him and showed him what it was like to be Christ-centered in his life. You know, parents, we have a unique privilege and responsibility that we can actually influence another human being here on planet Earth. And by the way, if you're not a parent this morning, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, you have that unique privilege and responsibility as well. You get to influence another one of God's creations through your example. And even if you're a mom this morning, please don't check out because there's something here for everybody this morning. Whether you're a mom, dad, Student, it doesn't matter. With that thought in mind, please open your Bibles this morning to two places. Turn to the Gospel of John chapter 19 and put a bookmark there. And then turn over to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. John 19, Matthew 1. Today we're going to talk about a very special mom who usually only gets discussed around Christmas time. And no, don't look at your calendar. It's not Christmas. And of course, we're talking about Mary. If there ever was a mom in history that deserved a lifetime movie, it was Mary, okay? Her story is one of, of love and commitment and faith that's so inspiring, not only for moms, but Christians everywhere. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, an unplanned pregnancy. An unplanned pregnancy. If your Bibles are open, Matthew chapter one, let's begin with verse 18. Matthew 1.18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall come with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So here we meet Mary and she's betrothed. That is, she's committed to be married to Joseph. And in their culture and a little bit in our culture today, this is a prearranged marriage. Betrothal, how it was different back in that day, though, it was official and binding. And if you were betrothed to someone, it actually took a certificate of divorce to get out of that. And so during this time 
a betrothal, the couple was known actually as husband and wife. And again, can only be broken through divorce. And so imagine what's going on here. Mary is betrothed to Joseph, and all of a sudden she is with child, even though they did not have relations before this time. My question is, how would society look upon this young couple? Who would believe in a million years that they had been faithful? Nobody. And so how would Joseph then respond to this news? There in your notes, everyone would expect Joseph to give Mary a letter of divorce, not for irreconcilable differences, but for supposed adultery. And catch this, according to their own law, Mary could be stoned for this. They'd take her out, bury her up to her shoulders, and then throw huge boulders at her until she was dead. You know, references were made all through Jesus' life that he was an unplanned, illegitimate child. Passages like John 8:18. 8, it says, I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And they, that's the religious leaders, said to him, Where is your father? Later, John 8, 39, Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Verse 41, you do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, and that's God. Extra biblical writings tell us that many were saying that Mary actually got pregnant by a Roman centurion. And so all these rumors were floating around. But Matthew, I love how this happens. Matthew sets a story straight for both then and now. She was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Spurgeon said this, there was no other way Jesus could have been born. For if he was born of a sinful father... He could not possess a divine nature. There in your notes. He is born of a woman that he might be human, but not by man, so that he might not be sinful. So Mary had to live with this innuendo all her life. Just, just imagine this. Imagine being Mary and having God come to you in a dream and tell you, you're going to have the Messiah. You're going to have Savior and all this. And for 33 years you got to live with the innuendo that you were somehow unfaithful. You're living with this your whole life. But then we look at Joseph. In Matthew 1.19, we start to see his sincere kindness. Because think about this. Women, you may not understand this, but men, you're going to understand this plenty. You know what you've been through. You know what has happened. And your fiancé comes to you and says, oh, by the way... I'm pregnant by God. How exciting. That's such great news. He's in such a terrible situation. Joseph is sitting there thinking, if I take her as my wife, I'm basically admitting that we have premarital sex. And by the way, both of us can be stoned for this in their law, both the man and the woman. And so he's publicly admitting, I'm the father of that child. And we weren't married. So the scriptures start to tell us that Joseph was a just man. But even though he's a just man, like most other men on the planet, he's starting to think, how can I protect her but not be stuck in this situation? What an ugly situation. I want no part of it. He forgot the prophecy in the Old Testament. Isaiah 7:14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. That is God with us. And even though Isaiah prophesied this 800 plus years before Jesus, Joseph had no reason to think that this was Mary's child. Why would he? But Joseph cared so much for Mary. So instead of exposing her to the consequences, he says, you know what? I'll just divorce her quietly. But then, look again at verse 20. But while he thought about these things, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. So imagine this. Joseph is dwelling on the situation. He kind of passes out on the couch just thinking about it. And as he passes out, the angel shows up and says, hey, don't put her away quietly. That's God's child in her belly. Take her as your wife. And notice he's called son of David. This should have been a clue. That's a reference to the lineage of King David. Messiah comes through King David. Joseph, son of David. Check it out. Now, we're not told whether or not Mary tried to explain this, but I would think that at some point, Joseph had to question, right? Hey, uh, <laughs> what happened here? And, we, you know, the Bible doesn't say Mary went and tried to tell him, but she probably did. But Joseph wasn't convinced until this angel says, behold, an angel, which means check it out. Hey, you, pay attention. And then notice, you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh saves. Jehovah saves. And Christ comes from Christos, meaning the anointed one, the Messiah. This is Jesus, God is salvation, the Christ, the Messiah. The Jewish people were expecting Messiah. There in your notes, the baby Jesus' purpose was clear. For he will save his people from their sins. What does that mean for us? Glad you asked. We get saved from the penalty of our sin, from the power of our sin, and from the presence of our sin. So turn on over to the Gospel of John now, chapter 19. And as you're turning there, let's really quickly just end this little part. So we see that Joseph hears from the angel... And he goes to Mary and he probably tells her all about it. Hey, check it out. An angel came and told me your pregnancy is from the Lord. I believe you. And here's what we glean from that. When we take God at his word, that's called faith. And it's only when we take God at his word and we get that faith that then we become righteous before God. That's how we earn righteousness is by faith in God. So now let's fast forward. You've got the story. You've got the Christmas story, Christmas morning story. Let's fast forward all the way to Jesus' crucifixion and see how Mary handled that. Number two there in your notes, a mother watches her child suffer. If your Bibles are open, John chapter 19, let's begin at verse 17. It says, and he, bearing his cross, went out to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather he said I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each a soldier apart and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. I want you to put yourself in Mary's shoes for just a moment. Mary knew who Jesus was. Mary knew all the promises. Mary has got it. And now she's standing by and she's watching this whole scene unfold. All this stuff taking place to her firstborn son. The trials, the beatings, the crucifixions all take place. There had to be a lot of questions in her heart. 
God, how could you? You ever been in a position, let me just ask you this, have you ever been in a position where you trusted God for something and the dream seemed to die? And it seemed to die in such a way that it ripped your heart out and you went, why God? You ever been in that position? I think everyone in this room would say, yeah, I've been there, done that. I've got the brownie button for that one. But here she's saying, God, you promised me. You told me. You did all this. Why are they crucifying my oldest son? You know, when the shepherds were told about the birth of Messiah, this is what we're told back in Luke chapter 2. It says, all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But catch this. But Mary kept all those things and pondered them in her heart. Again, Mary knows who Jesus is. She's convinced. She's more convinced who Jesus is than we're convinced who Jesus is. And she knew that he's the son of God. He, she knew he was Messiah. And she's got to be thinking, as God come in the flesh, why don't you get off of that cross? And what exactly was she witnessing? Because I think it's important for us to understand what she was witnessing. You know, we talk about the cross at communion every week here. So we kind of just glaze over, oh, the cross, oh, crucifixion. And I don't want to get real gory this morning, but I want to just give you just a glimpse of what she is watching. In 1968, scientists found the first body that was crucified back in Jesus's time and they unearthed the body. They did kind of a post-mortem examination. And what they found out is that the person who was crucified back then was nailed to the cross, yes. But the nails penetrated both feet right near the ankles. A strong ligament to hold them there. And then they went through the wrist about here to hold them there. And they did all this examination and realized how brutal it was. And I like that the Gospel of John doesn't go into the gory details here. Kind of spares us a little bit the gory details. The reason why John didn't need to give you the gory details or his readers, because back in that day, they knew what crucifixion looked like. So when he said, Jesus was crucified, everyone went, oh yeah, we've seen that. But I want to tell you something. The physical beating and brutality of the cross was nothing compared to the spiritual brutality that Jesus endured that day. Because right there on the cross, Jesus gave us a great exchange. And this is the greatest exchange in all of history. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he, God the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to actually become sin for us, and in exchange, we become the righteousness of God in him. Imagine for the first time for eons past, God the Son, the perfect Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, has all the sin of eternity past, eternity present, and future poured out on him in one moment. Think about the pain, the turmoil, and the fear that comes from sin. Try to just fathom for a minute I've said this so many times, but, you know, if you drive around our community, you could see the effects of sin on people. It is, it's heartbreaking. I mean, if your heart's not broken when you see people, you know, I was in Medford yesterday, and, and I mean, to see some of these people who are just the effects of their sin, it is, it's, it just breaks your heart. And that's the sin of one person. Imagine the sin of billions and billions and billions of people, the pain, the turmoil, all the destruction, all being poured out on one sinless lamb of God in one moment's time. But then let's look at Pilate for a minute. The Gospel of John, Pilate's having this personal struggle. And I love this, and I hate it at the same time. He knows Jesus is innocent, but he doesn't want to lose his political power. So he sends him to the cross anyway. And then he puts this sign up there and he says, the king of the Jews. Josephus said this about Pilate. Pilate lost his political position in 36 AD, three short years later. So I thought about this for a minute. What did Pilate's compromise to execute the sinless lamb of God by him? 
Three years. That's all it bought him. Three years of luxury. And in a few short years, he loses everything. You know, Jesus asked this question, and this question should hit us today. Matthew 16, 26, for what profit is it for a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? So I want to talk about Pilate for just a minute. Number one there in your notes, Pilate valued the wrong things. Temporary comfort and power instead of heaven and eternity. Number two, Pilate feared the wrong things. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. Number three, and this is a hard one for you men this morning. Pilate failed to heed God's warning sent to him in a dream through his wife. Listen to your wife. Pilate didn't listen to this supernatural warning, even though it came from someone he trusted. And then number four, Pilate failed to take a stand when he knew what was right. And here's the thing is Pilate's so double minded. He knows Jesus is innocent. He knows the innocent lamb of God, the sinless lamb of God. And yet he goes for it anyway and sends him to be crucified. And here's why. Here's what we do. A little compromise leads to a little more compromise. And it's a slow fade into compromise until you find yourself. You don't even know how you got there because compromise leads to compromise, which leads to compromise. And that's Pilate for you. And, and so these Jewish leaders are mad for two reasons. They just call him the king of the Jews. Number one, they're mad because they're saying Jesus is not Messiah. Don't call him that. But they're also mad saying if you call him king of the Jews while he's on a cross, it shows that Rome has the power to even kill our king. And so they're mad. You know, Jesus left heaven's throne. And he willingly took off his robe and laid it down and came as a baby. There in your notes, but here in the Gospel of John, they're getting ready to crucify Jesus and the soldiers take his garments. Jesus became completely poor that we might become spiritually rich in him. And what's so ironic is we look at this from 2023 and we look back and go, did Jesus not have any control whatsoever? We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning, you know. Did, could Jesus not do it? Could Jesus not call down legions of angels? Could Jesus not stop the cross? Galatians 2.21 says, If there were any other way to buy your salvation, if there were any other way, Christ died in vain. And I added to that this morning, and I said, Picture what an ogre God the Father is. He was the worst father that ever existed in the world if there was another way. Because picture this. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood. His heart is breaking. He's in anguish because he's fully man, fully God. And he says, and he looks up and he says, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. If there were another way, what a terrible father God the Father was. But there was no other way. And so Jesus says, not my will, but yours. So Jesus becomes completely poor that we can be spiritually rich. Now watch this. Number three, Jesus gives his mother away. Look at verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Think about this. Jesus is about to breathe his last. His death is right there. And right up to the very end, he cared about Mary and others more than himself. There in your notes, if there ever was a moment Jesus deserved to be self-focused, there it was. Yet he remained others-centered to the end. You know, ever since the fall of Adam in the garden, we are self-centered, self-focused, selfish people. Unfortunately, it's true. The Apostle Paul, while he was on death row, wrote the letter to the Philippians, and he said this in Philippians 2, 3. 
Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. So one last act. The disciple whom Jesus loved, of course, John, right? He asked him, take care of my mother like she was your mother. Some commentators believe this happened because Jesus' half-brothers were not saved yet. So he looks at John. He says, John, take care of my mother. But there in your notes, notice Jesus calls his earthly mother woman just as he had called her in Cana where he changed the water into wine. What's so significant about this? There's a relationship change happening. It goes from a mother and a son to a savior and a woman in need of a savior. There's a change happening right here. And he loves his mother so much he wants to look out for her. And you've got to imagine Mary's bawling her eyes out at this point. Tears rolling down her cheeks. Her biological son is dying. But finally, as Jesus breathes his last, and he said, it is finished, rises from the grave, Mary's vindicated for the first time in 33 years. Here's a woman that's been accused of adultery for 33 years, and for the first time, she's vindicated. So let's get practical this morning, because here's where the rubber meets the road. We've probably all heard that story before, and give me the so what. Bring it home for me. Okay. Here's the first one I would say, that Mary had to trust the Lord while her son's being brutalized. Put yourself in her shoes. How could you watch your child? When we go through things here on this earth, and we have these, this society that changes standards all the time, that goes against biblical standards, we need to have that same courage and faith Mary had. Because think about this, you know, your kid comes to you and they want to do or dress or do something because all my friends are doing it. And how hard is it to tell your teenager no? If I tell them no, I'm going to have a fight on my hands. It's so much easier just to let them do whatever they want. You need to have the courage and the faith that Mary had. Hebrews eleven twenty three. by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's commands. There in your notes, parents, it is possible to reject the standard of the world by faith in Christ because God's truth never changes. In order for someone to be a Christian that does not waver, it takes true faith. It's impossible to raise a child with biblical morality without Christ in you. If you try to do this without the Holy Spirit, if you try to do this on your own, you're going to be frustrated. To raise our children in this world's environment, we need someone stronger than us and to empower us to do it. I think of Timothy and his mom and his grandma who taught him how to live godly. Paul told his protege in 2 Timothy 1.3, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded it's in you as well. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you. You see, there's a time when God calls us to do something. But there's also times that God tells us not to do something. And it takes wisdom and understanding to know that. So, here we go. For us to have a godly influence on those around us, we must first, number one there in your notes, have a consistent trust and faith in God's directives. You know, Mary couldn't take Jesus' place on the cross, but I bet she wanted to. I bet she was willing to, but she did listen to God on how to parent that child. She could have done things her own way, right? She could have smothered Jesus while he was growing up, but instead 
She trusted Jesus to raise her child. You see, faith in Christ is not just giving our children whatever they want. That's not faith. Faith is taking God at his word. And sometimes it's taking God at his word even when we don't fully understand. And that's when it's tough. But Mary obeyed the Lord. You see, God sees the end of things. And I can imagine being Mary, back to Mary saying, why God? Why this? God sees the end. She's questioning why, but the whole time she never let go of her faith. I don't see how you're going to turn this situation around for good. God, I don't see how you're going to use this in my life. But Lord, I trust you. It hurts, but I trust you. Trust and obey his directives. Number two, and here's one I can't stand, is give up control to the Lord. As a person who kind of likes control, I say that in jest, this is a tough requirement for me personally. You see, I see a problem, I'm going to jump in and fix it, and then I'm going to ask God to direct me once I'm done. You know, there are times, and, and I've had wayward children, so I'm not just talking at you this morning, I'm talking from experience. These gray hairs on my head, I earned every one of them. But there are times that we need to turn our children completely over to the Lord. And it's the hardest thing you'll ever have to do. I'm going to tell you the hardest prayer, especially you expecting moms. I know there's like four or five of you in the room. The hardest prayer you'll ever say in your life is, God, whatever it takes, get them. And then to stand back and live with that prayer trusting that God will do whatever it takes. It's going to rip your heart out. It's going to bring tears to your eyes. But if you do that, God, whatever it takes, give them to God. He's a better parent. His wisdom, his ways are so far above your ways. There are times when our kids get into things and we're like, here's the thing is they need to hit rock bottom, but we keep putting this trampoline out and saving them. And then we ask the question, why can't God get a hold of their hearts? Because you won't get out of the way. Some of us are so burdened. And again, I'm not talking at you. I'm talking from experience. My kids were there and some are still there. And you feel trapped because of their lifestyles are even worse. And you're like, OK, God, whatever it's going to take, you get them. And their choices are devouring them. And you've got to stand by and God's saying, don't enable them. Oh, this is the thing that Jesus Christ has come to set us free from those burdens and those sins that plague us. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That promise may take some time to fulfill, but train them in the way they should go. And you know what? Even when they're wayward, Scripture will come back to mind. Those times they were in church with you will come back to mind. Those things will come back to mind. And, and it's like the prodigal son. You can eat with the pigs, but I've showed you how to do it right. You see, you, there, here's the thing, parents, and I don't mean to be so hard on you, but again, it's talking from experience. There is a God in heaven, and you're not him. And that's hard to realize sometimes. Okay, for us to have a godly influence on those around us, we must three, learn and teach God's truth. The greatest joy you'll ever have besides the physical birth of your child is their rebirth. Watching your children truly come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and accepting his free gift is the biggest joy you'll ever have as a parent. So I want to share with you the Shema. This comes out of the Old Testament. This is the first thing that a Jewish boy or girl would learn. And it's Deuteronomy 6, 4. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I have commanded you today will be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You'll bind them as a sign on your hand 
and they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So if you want to discern God's voice, let's really quickly break that down and I'm done. If you want to discern God's voice and raise your children in the way they should go, follow this Shema. There in your notes, according to Deuteronomy, we are to learn and teach God's truth because you can't give away what you've never received. If you're trying to teach something you don't know, good luck with that. All right, so let's fill in these blanks really quickly and I'll stop beating on you this morning. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> One, teach them God's truth when you sit in your house. Teach them God's truth when you walk by the way. Teach them God's truth when you lie down and teach them God's truth when you rise up. You see, God wants to realign our priorities and lives. In his mercy and grace, you know, Sandra and I sit back, our baby is 28 years old. I know I'm way too young for that. But our baby of four kids is 28 years old. And a lot of times we sit back and think, man, we made some mistakes. You know, I wish I could tell you I was perfect, but I'm not. I know that's a big surprise. But we sit back and go, man, we've made a mistake. If only, you know, by the time we got to our fourth kid, we just told him, just don't get arrested. Do whatever you want. <laughs> the older two, we were like drill sergeants, you know, wash those dishes, do this, do the laundry, do it. Do. And by the time Brandon came along, it was just do whatever you want. Don't get arrested, please, whatever. And we think back now and we go, man, we made a mistake. But I've often thought and I sit, step back and go, you know, we sought the Lord. We sought the Lord. We did well. We taught them. We took them to a wano. We taught them scripture. We loved on them. And no, we're not perfect. We're far from it. But you know what? God is good and he's merciful. And I do know even my wayward children, when they quote scripture and they're going through something, I know that I shouldn't say I told you so because that's probably not the right answer. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's never too late for a person unless they die without Christ. Amen. And so I look at some of these children and I think, man, you know, you know, you know Jesus and you know the way. And, and so that's what I would encourage you this morning, parents and non-parents alike, Everyone who's a believer in here that has breath in their lungs and their heart's still beating this morning, you can influence another part of God's creation with the gospel of Christ. And by the way, it's a call and a responsibility to do that. And what a privilege that the God of all the earth, the lover of our soul, the one who sought and chased and found us, would use us to influence someone else's life. Man, there's no better thing on earth. And why God would use this is incredible. So it's never too late unless you leave this earth without Jesus. Then it's too late. And I don't want you to be down on yourself because you know what? Today's a good day to start parenting right. You been parenting wrong? Guess what? We serve a God of U-turns. We serve a God another chance. It's not just one more chance, another 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 and today's a great day to start grandparenting better parenting better or whatever today is a great day today's the day of salvation let's pray thank you for listening to pastor rich preach the topical mother's day sermon titled a special mother from matthew 1 verses 18 through 25 and john 19 verses 17 through 27 tune in next week as associate pastor andy continues the gospel of mark's sermon series you can also be part of our Sunday service in person or online every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithklamath.com, that is livingfaithklamath.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath, that is Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the Word of God. Thank you again, and God bless you.